All right, good evening. Welcome to a Tech Jam session, which I'm going to be hosting and I'm going to be talking, so it's interesting. Uh, again, this is kind of unusual. Last time we did the things on the top, uh, it was too noisy, so we thought this time we'll try and do it over here. A uh, few people have been here before, so you know it's good to see the same familiar faces back. This time we picked a topic which is basically centered around testing. How do we improve, uh, you know? the current state of where we are in terms of testing and take it to the next level. Uh, a lot of this is based on my personal experience having worked with different companies where we've tried to uh, you know, put in the right testing practices. Uh, so that's what basically this is. And uh, as we go along, I'll try and make it as much interactive as possible. So it's just not me speaking. It's more of a knowledge sharing between the group over here. So with that, we'll get started. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Ideas for hosting this. Uh, again, very helpful to have someone who can take care of all the logistics for us. So thanks, guys. Uh, if my remote works, which doesn't seem to work. There we go. No. <laughs> Murphy's Law. Let's see now. Okay, that works. So hopefully this should work. All right. Uh, remember back in those days when you know how we used to build software back in the Stone Age. We would get together, plan how we need to build stuff. Then we come up with the big grand design of how Taj Mahal will look. And then basically we distribute the work, we divide the work amongst different team members, get everyone to take their piece of work and go off in isolation and start working on that. And then you know they, they obviously work in isolation, the work continues for a while. And then what do we do? Try and bring everyone together to see how things work, right? And this obviously leads to things like last minute integration surprises. Uh, Things are visible, bad things are visible only too late in the process, uh, and many other things. So to try and avoid this, one of the things we tried to do back in the days, I think it was 2001, 2002, uh, you know, came the birth of continuous integration. So the idea with continuous integration was typically uh, you have developers working on different machines, and they check in code before they check in code. Obviously, they will pull code from the repository. They will run on their local machine. Everything should be good. And then they push the code. Right there was a little daemon process. It was actually a cron job when it was first built. A little cron job that would sit and basically wake up every three minutes, I think is how we configured it, uh, to pull the version control and see if there is any new code. If there is new code available, it would check out the code, uh, compile it, run the build, run some static analysis tools in it. And if everything is good, then publish a report saying, you know, the world is happy. You know, what you checked in is good to go. Uh, and if something went wrong, then it would obviously come and spank you, right? That's the idea with continuous integration. Uh, when this was originally created, it was just a way, because we are lazy guys, we didn't want to manually do a lot of stuff. The idea was that, you know, let's just delegate it to a machine. Let the machine do this thing uh, instead of us having to do. Uh, only later, maybe after six months, we realized what the power of uh, something like this was, right? Uh, the thing with continuous integration we found was that the collaboration between team members improved. Why did the collaboration improve? Because now people were checking in code more frequently because they wanted to know how things were, you know, whether they broke. And before they would check in, if they would update, you know, if there was anything, they would go and talk to people. So there was more collaboration. People would discuss more frequently, saying, hey, I'm about to check in this. If anyone's working on this, you know, make sure you update. So there was a lo lot more collaboration in general we saw. Uh, the delivery time went down because we didn't have last minute surprises. We didn't have to do things like that. So the delivery time went down. The feedback, in general, people were checking in code more frequently. So they were getting more feedback faster. Uh, the wastage in terms of time spent trying to figure out who broke, when, what happened, all of those things went down. Uh, and that led to an overall improvement in the quality. So this is fantastic, right? I mean, we saw this. This is now a de facto practice in every team. So we are now not in the Stone Age. Uh, 
then suddenly came along the lean startup community. What was the lean startup community doing? Obviously not one guy sitting in the garage and hacking code, right? That's not lean startup anymore. The, those days are gone. Uh, lean startup community is essentially any, any kind of working in a high uh, flexible environment where things are highly dynamic environment where things are changing, a lot of uncertainty, which is I believe most real business applications these days work in that kind of an environment where things are changing very rapidly. And you need to operate like a startup. You need to operate like you know, you need to be as lean as possible to get things out of the door as quickly as possible. So one of the things the lean startup community was doing was what they call as the continuous deployment. So with continuous integration, we pretty much stopped at this point and then, you know, maybe once in two weeks or maybe once in a month, we would actually ship the actual software out. These guys pushed it to one extra level. They said, why stop here? Why not just deploy it to production? If you have something ready, why not? give it to the customers, they can use it right away, right? And that was like a revolutionary idea. People said, that's stupid, that wouldn't work, right? Customers are not going to accept that. Uh, but yet, some teams did this, and it's worked really well for many organizations. Uh, an example that every, all of you get exposed to, continuous deployment. Anyone can tell me what's an example that you get exposed to? Uh, Gmail, all of these guys are deploying multiple times every day and you're getting latest, greatest software anytime you're actually going in there to use the software. Now, that works great if you are a hosted service, right? But what about things like desktop clients or, you know, other kinds of things which are distributed, games or stuff like that? Can you do the same? What if you have some software that's installed on your machine? Right? Can you do continuous deployment on that? Auto updates, right? Chrome was one of them who really pushed the envelope on that. If you see Chrome, uh, the way even they architected it, it was intentionally done such that, you know, uh, while your browser is running, in the background it can upgrade and it can kill certain processes and restart them without you actually ever having to shut down Chrome. Uh, I think some time ago they changed the, you know, logo of Chrome. And pretty much no one noticed because they didn't have to shut down and start again. But when they went to their desktop, they saw the logo is now suddenly different. Right? Things like that people have been doing. So it's worked really well. I've built a bunch of games for one of my startup, and there we do continuous deployment as well. It's iPad games, and we, you know, every time you know a kid is kind of playing the game, it automatically updates the game and stuff like that. These are things that we've been constantly trying to push the envelope. So in my opinion, this has become like the dream for every company these days, is to get to continuous deployment, is to eliminate all the wastage that it takes from the time you've identified, you know, something is good to the time it's actually available to the customers, to make that process as seamless as possible, right? But not everyone is there. And why do you think not everyone is there? One is the lack of confidence and, you know, automated testing could add to that, right? The lack of confidence. What else? If you have legacy. Uh, and again, that goes back to not having confidence. Even if I had legacy, but if I had confidence, then I could still go ahead. But no, having confidence is not sufficient. There are other things that are important. You need quick feedback cycles, and you need to be able to be quite sure, quite confident before you push it out, right? The other thing is about convincing your users. In a lot of places, users don't want new software every time, right? They want something that's working, don't bother us. The third thing is the sales guys. How do they sell new software if you're going to constantly keep pushing new software? Like what happens to all this version, uh, different version, marketing them? pricing them differently. So there's a lot of issues around that. But the, at the heart of it, if you think about it, most companies don't even go there because of lack of confidence, because not having the kind of automated testing, not having the kind of automated checks, not having a deployment strategy of how you can push stuff out of the door, right? So in the grand scheme of things, one thing that really strikes 
you know quite often is this software uh, <coughs> software testing ice cream cone problem uh, where the way our testing strategy is structured is that we spend to we spend very little time on the unit test and we tend to spend a lot of time on manual checking uh, and whenever you have that manual checking component which is fairly large uh, you will not have the ability to for a developer to check in code and it to be available in production right so what we are here to discuss is to kind of deep dive into this topic of you know what is the reasons behind this ice cream cone problem and how do we if we all agree that this is not where we want to be then how do we go about inverting this pyramid to get it in the right structure that will help us to get to continuous deployment so that's the context of the talk today right uh, what I want you to do now is maybe form smaller groups and in your groups I want you to come up with three top reasons why you think uh, you know most companies most organizations most teams end up with this kind of a pyramid right so I want you to form smaller groups and in your groups I want you to come up with maybe two or three points why you think most companies end up with that and then we can tackle those things. It'd be good if uh, people from the same companies don't hurdle together because you're not going to learn too much, right? The idea is to mix up and learn from other people's experience as well, right? So if you're all sitting from the same company, try and find someone else, right? Let's let's.
Okay, I think that's good time to have a discussion. So what we'll do is we'll ask quickly, you know, whichever group wants to volunteer with their top three reasons that they think, and if anyone else, any other group feels that some point was not covered, then they can chip in, right? So whichever group wants to volunteer with their top three reasons why they think we end up there, yeah? So developers checking in code that is not stable and that leading to having to manually check, okay? That's, so that's one of the reasons why we end up over there. So unknown requirements, changing requirements, volatile requirements, ambiguity around requirements could lead to not being able to pr be prepared at the beginning and then, you know, having to do all of that manually, okay? Lack of skill. Uh, people not having the skill to do some certain things that requires us to do things. So there's knowledge and skill gaps, okay? Those are three good reasons. Any other group wants to contribute anything other than these three? We'll go there and then we'll come there. Yeah. It's more of mindset. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> So the whole mindset around having faster feedback cycles, having more agility in the whole process, that, that mindset shift is one thing. Okay, cool. Anything else? Again, I would say it's a mindset thing because there are tools available in pretty much every language. Uh, if the computer can understand it, I can automate it. <laughs> uh, fair enough. So we'll go to that group if you had any other points to add. So the way our process is set up, uh, where testing typically comes towards the end, and that leads to us having to end up with something like this. So that's another very important point, right? Lack of collaboration between the different roles, between the different parts uh, to make sure that the system is working smoothly. So lack of collaboration, okay? Cool. All right. Did we miss any point? Lack of collaboration, again, leading to lack of trust, I would say, you know, fair enough. Lack so if you're trying to operate in small cycles, like especially when you move to Scrum or things like that, when you're working in small cycles and then if you're still wa following waterfall model, right, squeezed waterfall model, then, you know, that would become, you know, manual testing would be the fastest way, or at least it appears to be the fastest way to do things. Okay, cool.
So there's that separation, the collaboration, and uh, things associated with that. Okay. All right. Certain kinds of things cannot be tested, which is why the pyramid. We, we it's a pyramid. It's not a flat line, right? <laughs> Everything could be tested, but again, that's a myth. A lot of things can be tested. It's again, in my opinion, a question of uh, exposure. Because there are companies which are deploying software continuously. Do you think Chrome's functionality is pretty horrible? It's small. So it's a very interesting point you bring up, right? And uh, my argument to that is that the smaller the change, the smaller that is, it's so small that they cannot notice it. Then that much easier it becomes to continuously keep deploying. If you accumulate things and you put a big feature out there, then you know they do need the training, or at least that's the mindset in the past. Uh, and we are trying to move away from that, but I'm not debating that it is you know always possible. So pretty much all continuous deployment strategies revolve around not actually having, because it's too risky to push it one shot to everyone. So all of them would have a multi-stage deployment strategy. They're much more involved, so they're aware of what's coming up, and they're much more in tune with what the expectation should be. Hopefully, that can reduce, maybe not completely take away, but reduce the time uh, in terms of training and other kinds of things, right? Uh, but the point is that you have a very valid point that there are trainings, there are other kinds of things that is one of the roadblocks for some companies. Uh, and people are trying to find creative ways of kind of working around that because the advantages you get with being able to push cons constantly, right, is so much huge that, you know, it is really important. Uh, Let's come back to the topic and you know focus a little bit on if let's assume we want to get there, right? Whether we actually do it or not is secondary, but are we also in a position to be able to do it? And a lot of organizations, in my opinion, are not even in a position to do it. If they had the option, maybe they could go to it, but they're not even at that position to have talking about the options at this point. So let's look at an example from another industry. Uh, where we can talk about, you know, how this played out. Uh, so this is a power loom. Uh, I grew up in Bangalore, which is which was very popular for power looms. I say it was very popular because now you don't see you see software factories instead of this. Uh, and one of the things over there was, you know, typically an owner would have about 10 to 12 looms in a building. In the morning, they would set up the looms, let the looms run through the day, right? And then in the evening, they would get a bunch of people to come sit in front of each other. And then they would sit and then they would check all the cloth that was manufactured in that day, right? And if they would find any thread missing, then that's a defective cloth. They would take it out. If they see any insect woven along with the cloth, then that's a new design. Customers don't like it, so you take it out, right? Uh, and what they found was that uh, up to about 30% 
of the cloth that was manufactured was actually coming out as defective cloth, right? The profit margins were around 20, 25 percent. Defective cloth was about 30 percent. So what ended up happening to them? I mean, they didn't give up so easily, right? <laughs> they, they're obviously smart business people. Uh, so one option they tried was uh, they started getting uh, these guys who come in the end of the day, and then they had each of these persons standing at the loom, right? So you catch the error as quickly as possible. If, if a thread breaks, then stop the machine, fix the thread, let it run. If an insect is coming along the way, you know, get it off the way. You know, things like that. Uh, how do you think that would have succeeded? The wasted cloth percentage would go down, okay? So do you think that's a good model to solve the problem? So the cost would have increased, uh, Samir, you said them. They have to pay the person. Earlier, they only had to pay for two hours. Now they have to pay the person for the whole time. So the person has to, uh, so the operating cost went up. Uh, what else? You said how, you don't know how feasible it is, right? Cost point, OK. Couldn't we build it because that required someone to put their brains to use, right? Uh, which generally we don't like to do. Uh, the other thing that they saw when they did that, and this is particularly in India, is that people generally would take lunch breaks, other kinds of breaks during the day. And then they are in this dilemma. Do they let the loom run and take a chance of something slipping by, or do they stop the loom whenever they take a break? Right? And inevitably, the production of the plant itself went down. Operating cost increased, production went down. Right? Again, why am I talking about this? Can anyone draw an analogy between this and software? So you're talking about fixing the defect and then the cost would go up to fix the defect. We are lucky in software we can fix defects after the fact as well. Not as well, but we try. More manual testing is getting in the way of uh, the speed of delivery. Okay. Adding more observers will not solve the problem. Very well stated, right? So the analogy I'm trying to draw is if you see a lot of scrum teams, a lot of so-called agile teams, right? What they try and do is they try and put one tester on each team or a couple of testers on each team. And they think now you will start getting great quality products. Not seen a single company get there using that approach, right? Maybe they get some initial productivity gains. They see some benefits. But that's not a sustainable model, right? As the product keeps growing, uh, you have a lot of other issues that you need to deal with. So while all of this was going on in India and people were going bankrupt, selling the lands to the software companies, so software companies could come and repeat the same cycle again, right? Uh, in Japan, uh, there was this little company uh, called Toyota, which is the company which actually funded or started Toyota, the car company, right? They hold, I think, 106 patents on looms. Right. Uh, the first thing they did is they did an analysis of what causes the ma majority of defects. And they found that breakage of thread because of high tension when the, the thread is spinning to go up is the cause for the highest amount of defects. So the first thing they did was they essentially put small levers on each thread. So the thread basically grows up. They put small levers on each thread. As soon as the thread breaks, it goes jams the machine. Right. It's a small little lever that will go jam the machine. And that way, they now could have just one person for the whole factory. And whenever things broke, the person could go fix and let the looms run other ways. Right? And they went on to innovate, that, you know, to, to even avoid that one single person. Uh, again, given their circumstances in Japan, lack of people, Second World War, all of those situations, uh, 
automation was the way to go for them. Uh, what they were trying to do was they were trying to mistake proof the loom rather than trying to put inspection, right? So there are two fundamental philosophies when it comes to testing, if you see. One way to approach it is to add more people to inspect, add more steps to inspect, put a more rigid process, put a checklist, do all of that. All of that is based on an inspection-based approach, right? And the other model that people talk about, uh, which comes more from the lean space, is to use mistake proofing, is to set up things such that mistake cannot get in, in the first place, right? So there are two kind of fundamental thought processes. And the lean guys will tell you inspection considered harmful or inspection is wasteful, right? Don't spend time and money on inspection. Instead, mistake proof your process. So what's the corollary of our parallel to that in the software world? Sure, but then you could add livers, you could mistake proof it to some extent, maybe not change the whole loom. Typically, if you see, these guys will dismantle the loom, they do a lot of stuff. It is, it is like how we had Bajaj scooters, people would be opening up parts and fixing things, right? So you could do that, no one stops that. You don't, you, you, you know, it's not like a laptop, you open stuff and the warranty is void. You're free to freak out with it. So people could do that and that's how, you know, Toyota started as well, right? They started fixing things and then they became like a more powerful company. But you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a choice that people could exercise, but they could choose to live with the problem. If the livers could have not been added to the machine at all. In software, at least we don't have that problem. <laughs> we can put livers everywhere we want. They could switch the loom, the choice. Because the cost of the machine, the cost of the machine is relatively lower compared to the operating cost over a month for them. Yeah. The machines back then were not that expensive. Like a, a normal guy would have 10 to 12 looms in a, in, in a small house. It was not like a lack of rupees for, for one loom. It was relatively cheaper. So you could switch looms, you could put other kinds of things, but valid point that, you know, there is a, uh, you know, not everyone would have exercised that option. At least in software we can. We don't have to live with, you know, saying we are helpless. We cannot mistake proof our process. So <clears throat> what are the techniques you think in software we could do to mistake proof, to mistake proof our process instead of putting more and more inspection? Right, that's kind of the fundamental crux of this whole talk, right? And then we'll get into techniques of what we could do in terms of mistake proofing and, you know, how we could address some of the challenges that people had highlighted when we started. So what I want to do again is another smaller group activity where you guys are going to come up in your groups in terms of what are the kind of things that you could do to mistake proof uh, things from getting in the first place. How can we stop defect from getting in the first place rather than spending a lot of time finding them and then fixing them, right? So five minutes, smaller group activity, each group comes up with top three points. Camera not towards me. If I stand here, you cannot see me.
All right, do we have uh, some points that we can discuss? So which group wants to go first? Yeah, go ahead. What else? <laughs> mistake proofing, techniques for mistake proofing, not general points. Again, inspection based approach, in my opinion, you have to have a checklist, stop there, right, let's not go there. The moment you say checklist, stop, it requires inspection. Think of a world without checklists, right? Testing in parallel with developers. Testing in parallel with developers, again, inspection based approach. Model year uh, <laughs> what if what if your business guys wrote the test? <laughs> if they write the acceptance criteria which are automated and that's your requirement right then that's one way to mistake proof things okay good we had someone another point over there inspection oh hang on one second yeah
so test driven development is a technique to kind of uh, you know avoid some of the common mistakes that at least you know that could happen okay uh, pair programming so pair programming again uh, requires two people working together on the same problem which means that you can stop things from going wrong before they go wrong uh, if you're actually pairing well if one guy is just sitting and watching the other guy then maybe it's more inspection based No, so if the other guy is sitting and watching, then the guy is inspecting, right? If both of you are trying to work together even before you write code, if you're discussing, if you're walking through, you're talking through it, you're trying to make sure that things are heading in the right direction, you could stop a lot of things from going wrong beforehand, right? Yeah, if you're busy on the phone while the other person is programming, then <laughs> it might not work really well. Someone else had a point over there. Finding root cause. Uh, that's a good point, even though it fits a little bit into the inspection reactive approach. It's not a proactive approach, but whenever things do slip out, instead of just trying to, you know, put more checks at it, to go to the root cause and try to mistake proof that so that it doesn't occur in the future. What could be a specific example of that? If you write integration tests. Uh, still feels very inspection based in my opinion. So I'll give you an example, right? Uh, continuous integration is a great example of stopping things and then going to the root cause and figuring out how you stop this from happening in the future. So if when someone checks in, if things break, then you don't just, you know, un comment out the test and let it run, right? You try and find what was the cause and you fix it before uh, others get impacted by it. That's one thing of stop the production line kind of a culture, right? Even better, have auto test and let the test keep continuously running in the background as you program, right? That takes it even further. So that's as close as, you know, the liver going and jamming the machine when something goes wrong execute uh, for those files or things like IDEs right these days IDEs have got really smart they give you instant feedback when you make a mistake sometimes they annoy you but most often they give you good feedback instantaneously uh, whenever things go wrong right so that's again trying to mistake proof things I remember back in the days we used to write code then go to another place and then put it over there compile it over there then go to another place and then you would figure out oh something is wrong right so we've come a long way since then in terms of mistake proofing, stopping things from going wrong in the first place, right? People talk about taking it to the next level. As you type code, as you change stuff, you can see in production how things impact because of that, right? People are doing other things, what is referred to as, uh, I can't take the name, but there is a specific technique where certain companies, when developers change code, it parallelly runs with, uh, your actual production code looks, evaluates the results on both and verifies if what changes you're making will actually impact the results, will impact something. And then they'll give you feedback instantaneously. So the people have gone like a long way to try and figure out some of these things. Uh, so again, we will get into more specifics, but this is the kind of thought process that is required in terms of how you can mistake proof things, how you can stop things from going wrong in the first place, right? And certainly need to break the silo between developer, oh, I'm a developer, I'm a tester. Uh, those days, again, in my opinion, are gone. I mean, that's not going to be the future. So before we get started, a quick commercial break. Uh, my name is Naresh Jain. I live in Mumbai. Don't act in Bollywood. Uh, 
I was part of the team which built the first e-learning for agile practices and one of the things we did over there very rigorously, we were a team of seven people, uh, didn't have the luxury to have testers on our team. So whenever we wrote a code, we checked in, we had to be 100% sure that it would work and then it would get actually deployed instantaneously. Uh, we had a specific rollout strategy in terms of who would see the change and if those people approve the change or they don't find any issues, then it gets rolled out to the next group and things like that. Uh, after that, I built another company called Adventure Labs where we tried to uh, build games for kids to learn mental arithmetic and stuff like that. Again, a three people team didn't have the luxury of having testers. Uh, so when we wrote code, it had to work and it would actually be continuously deployed to kids playing and we would collect analytics. This is another big aspect that is coming out of the lean startup is to actually collect, uh, very consciously keep collecting data from the usage of the users and try to analyze that and understand the changes that you're making, is it making it better, is it making it worse, uh, things like that. A bunch of other products uh, started the Agile Software Community of India back in 2004, built a whole bunch of uh, software surrounding uh, conference management and stuff like that, bunch of companies that I've worked as either as an employee or as a consultant. Uh, so that's a quick background about myself, where I come from, what I've done. And then we can come back to the topic of we have this ice cream that we all like, but we want to move away from that because it's not very healthy for us, right? We want to get into something of this nature. Uh, this is what we call as the inverting the testing pyramid uh, or inverting the test pyramid. And actually the name was inspired by a book which was on uh, football. Uh, again, we software people draw we lack innovation, so we draw analogies from wherever we can find, right? Uh, this book talks about how the uh, European teams changed their strategy in terms of their team structure uh, because of the massive defeats that they faced from the South American teams. Uh, if you see traditionally, the uh, European football teams had a lot of forwards, very few midfielders, and very little defenders. That was their strategy, very heavy on forwards. Uh, while the uh, South American teams had a completely opposite strategy, very strong on defense, few midfielders, and then very little forwards, and then these guys can be generalizing specialists, which means these guys can go forward and then start shooting, but they're generally there kind of being very heavy. It was also kind of reaction because they were very forward heavy. These guys had to be very defense heavy, right? Uh, but that was kind of one of the strategies and then, you know, this guy wrote a book analyzing how because of this stream structure, the strategies, the, the how the teams play, what techniques they use are quite different. And then it actually turned around that now you see a lot of European teams follow this strategy. Uh, so we kind of got inspired from the same and that's where the whole inverting the testing pyramid comes from. If you take a typical example, uh, a layered application, right? Uh, the general misconception is that if I did end-to-end -end tests, then I am pretty cool, like I know everything is working, right? Uh, what is the misconception over there? You might be missing scenarios, but let's say I went really rigorous, right? And I, I made sure every single scenario is covered. How do I make sure every single scenario is covered? I look at every... You know, in, in this specific case, I look at every node and every edge, uh, and I make sure that I have the node into edge number of test cases which will cover every single path, and then I can be 100% sure that, you know, things will not break. Of course, you cannot 100, be 100% 100 sure because also data plays another aspect. You might have covered all these scenarios, but with a certain set of data, if you take a different set of data, maybe things will break down. But let's say you've taken into account all possible data, all possible paths. How many test cases would you need to get that kind of a confidence? It would be, again, uh, A, the number of edges into the nodes plus the number of different data points that you have, right? Those many number of test cases you will need to be sure that things will not go wrong. What will happen to the speed of your build? How frequently can you deploy software if you went down that road? The test would take an awfully long time, right? And the test would be fairly complicated. Why would the test be complicated? 
because now every test needs to make sure that everybody else is ready to go. Right data is set up, right infrastructure is plumbed together, servers are up, big wire of a network is laid out so that the data can go across, all of that stuff, right? So in this very simple example, we demonstrate that if you were to really try and do end-to-end -end tests, you would need about 70 complex fragile end-to-end -end tests. They are fragile because, you know, a small change somewhere can lead a whole bunch of them to break. Uh, the other big problem with this is this does not give you pinpointed feedback. When something fails, you spend the next half an hour or half a day debugging what went wrong. It doesn't give you pinpointed feedback. It's like, you know, in the loom case, someone saying, oh, something went wrong. Go figure out. Get a bunch of people who will go check what went wrong. Right? Uh, instead, if we kind of shifted our focus to focusing a little bit more on the individual parts first, right? And then we did a little bit of end-to-end -end tests. Then you would see that the amount of effort and the kind of test and the assurance that you would get would be much higher. Uh, the other thing with these lower level tests, let's not call them unit tests for now, but let's call them lower level tests, they give you is you can do negative path scenarios very effectively. Trying to do negative path scenarios from end to end is pretty hard. Imagine trying to simulate a deadlock condition in your database. Pretty, pretty hard to try and do it from here. But let's say I have some code over here which detects a deadlock condition and then retries after three seconds, right? How do I check that, that that actually works? I can simply simulate a deadlock condition and see if my code retries after three seconds, right? So it gives you ability to do negative path tests much more effectively, right? The other thing I did was on one of the projects, uh, we did a little bit of study to try and understand how much effort goes in what level of tests and what is the return on investment in terms of, you know, what benefit do we get in terms of long-term benefit from that. And one of the things we found that, you know, unit tests took us about 10% of effort and the return for us was about 90%. While as we moved up, the effort was too high to maintain those, to, to manage those, to build them, to, uh, you know, keep them up and running. Uh, and the return on investment in terms of the number of issues that were found because of it were very few. This is not true. If you don't have anything over here, then everything you'll find over here, right? Imagine uh, Toyota built a car and they said, you know, we have this wonderful car we have built. We have not checked whether the engine works. We have not checked whether the transmission works, but we want you to test drive this. Right? How many people would sit in that car? What would you tell them instead? Why don't you take your engine, forget your engine first, why don't you take your pistons and check if they work, right? Whether they, they follow certain standards, whether they meet certain criteria, then why don't you take your engine and make sure that the pistons actually work in conjunction inside your engine correctly? Right? Then why don't you see your transmission works? Why don't you test if your brakes work alone? Right? Forget the whole car. I'm not sitting in there. Right? Make sure the brakes work. But when it comes to software, a lot of us feel like, you know, let's just go on a test drive. Forget all that stuff, right? Forget testing the brakes. I know it works because I built it. <laughs> let's just go for a test drive. That's that's the kind of analogy, right? I mean, it's scary when you think about it. So what we need is we need this thing back. I'm going to not go into details of each of these because there's a fairly detailed, dense slide that people throw tomatoes at me when I show <laughs> because it's very dense. Uh, it, it has a lot of information about what each kind of test does, what it means, what can be done over there, who's the, uh, you know, recipient for it, who writes it, who runs it. Uh, we'll, we'll quickly briefly discuss that, but before we go into that, uh, you know, this is typically what a lot of people talk about as the right pyramid structure. Uh, this works fine if you're a small single team working on in isolation experience. As you have a large team that has to work across geography, across different locations, 
different modules, you start breaking your large components into smaller components, you need many more different levels of tests, right? So let's quickly uh, talk about each kind of test without going into too much detail what each of them mean. Uh, what is a unit test? Depending on the paradigm you are in, if you are in an object oriented paradigm or a procedural paradigm or a functional paradigm, each paradigm defines what the unit is. In an object oriented world, a class is a unit, right? So a unit test would say, you know, I want to make sure this class is working the way I want in isolation, right? That's the idea behind unit test, is I want to make sure this class works in isolation uh, with itself. What is business logic acceptance test? From a business logic point of view, does the, the set of classes or this individual class where I have all my business rules, does it function the way I expect it to function, right? So that's more of validating my business rules. Then we talk about, you know, the integration test, which is, which is again, quite often people confuse what an integration test is. Uh, so let's take a very simple example to understand what an integration test is. Let's say I'm building a simple calculator application, right? I have the UI of the calculator where I can click buttons, right? And it has a display that it can show the results. I have a backend service or I have an API that someone's exposed where I send, I call to it, and then it does the calculation and send it back to me, right? So what unit tests would I do and where would I do unit tests? On the back end, I could test if given two numbers, does it add correctly, does it subtract correctly, if I give negative numbers, how does it behave? You know, I could test all the logic of my calculator over there. What could I test on my UI or on my front end? I could check if I press the buttons, it shows the right numbers, right? When I give the right combination of things, does it make the right call? All of those things, again, can be tested in isolation. I don't need a server lying around. So I've unit tested my UI saying, you know, if 5 is given, it does it actually show 5. You know, when I press a whole bunch of sequence of numbers very rapidly, does it behave correctly? If it overflows from the screen size, what happens? How does it behave? Does the numbers auto shift or it gets fixed? All of those things are what you would do at a unit level, right? You don't need the server lying around for that. On the server side, you could individually test your calculations. Then what is, what is the need for an integration test or what would an integration test look like? You want to test the communication works properly or not? Okay. So let's explore that. That's a good point. Let's say I give two and three. What would you do in your test? You would check if you got back five. See, that's where I think that the disconnect. In my opinion, that's not a uh, not a unit integration test because in an integration test, now you have two reasons for that test to fail. If two plus three did not come as five, which means there was a functionality issue, then that integration test would fail. And the other reason the integration test would fail is what you were talking earlier is whether the communication is set up, whether I have the right endpoints configured, whether I have the right permissions, whether I can call it and things like that, right? So there are two things over there. And to me, an integration test should focus predominantly on the configuration, making sure these two guys can talk to each other, right APIs, right messages are being sent. Whether I get five back, I get zero back, whether I get some random number is not a problem because that I have really, you know, tested out at the unit level. So it is not possible that I get two and three and suddenly I get eight, right? That I have verified at the unit level. Here I'm verifying whether I can actually talk to this thing. So that's what we mean by an integration test. You will put that in your integration test. The question is, your, are you testing, what are you testing? You're testing your query. Or are you testing the database? If you're testing your query, can you test your query in isolation? Uh, 
uh, I would I would do things like a simulator, an in-memory database. So it is in memory, in process, right? There is no network, there is none of that involved. And then I would verify if my query itself functions correctly or not. I'm not interested if the database gives me the right results or not. Just an example, right? That's the thought process around. So that I've now taken an integration test, converted into a unit test. It's a unit test to check if my SQL works correctly. And I'm interested in my SQL, nothing else. Right? So again, uh, that's the thought process that is very important in my opinion, and that's what we call as the integration test at this layer. Right? Uh, what these numbers talk about is essentially what is the coverage that you want to get out of it. It's not the effort. It's the coverage that you want to get out of it. These are not some numbers that I just had a lot of beer and I wrote. Right? These are numbers that were based on retrospective on a project. What were we seeing? You know, what was the kind of coverage we were getting when we felt we were at the right testing pyramid? Right? So then let's talk about what is a workflow test. So far, is everyone with me? Is this helpful? I'm trying to build up to get to the point I'm trying to get to. Right? Uh, what is a workflow test? So I know that I can make an API call and it functions correctly up till this point. Right? But most applications don't just make one API call and I'll be happy. Right? In most cases, I have to work in a sequence of steps to achieve something. Right? So does the sequence of steps work correctly? Is your server doing the right kind of things right? as you work from a sequence of steps, sessions, other kinds of things? You want to make sure all of those things are working correctly. This also helps someone understand how your product behaves. So it acts also very good to understand how something works. If I want to check out an item of from Amazon shopping cart, I mean, that's an example we all know. But you know, if I want to understand what are the steps, how things flow, what information should be traded in, what information I get back, then that's what I would try and capture at a workflow test. You would be covering them in your unit test, but then there might be things like from my service. I would write things which will go all the way, won't hit the database, but will try and make sure that I can actually go end to end. At the unit level, I can show you an example where I want to make sure that from a business point of view, that's a unit for me. right? And I want to make sure that works correctly without actually hitting the database or other kinds of things. Uh, if you need to hit the database, we can find ways of trying to work around that database, file system, any network stuff, right? So this is the difference between this and the higher level things that they actually hit, they go all the way through, while these work still in isolation more from the business logic point of view. Because your business logic might not be just in one class. The business logic might be distributed across three classes, right? I can later show an example where we did this and I can bring that up, but that's the idea with the business logic acceptance test. A lot of times you can do performance tests over here. Let's say you're getting a bunch of data back and you're doing some heavy crunching on it, and that's intensive, right? You might actually be able to do you know, performance tests. Let's say I'm going to be dealing with a million emails every second and I want to write an anti-spam server on it, right? The spam-related logic could actually be tested here, and I could do performance testing on it. I could see in isolation how uh, this thing performs, how much memory footprint it has, this, things like that. Uh, that obviously we can't do here. Then at the workflow test, we can see how you know five people have marked something as spam. Then how does you uh, how does your uh, you know server re respond to it when you are coming from the same organization? Things like that. Uh, then we move to what we call as the end-to-end -end test with a flow test, but one layer below the UI. What we mean one layer below the UI is we're not actually poking things on the UI. Instead, we are using let's say a controller or something below that and driving things. Uh, a lot of times th these two are very close for organizations, but again, depends on what is the nature of your application. They, they, you could split them into two things. And finally, we need some kind of UI test to basically make sure the sanity in terms of the navigation and stuff like that is breaking. Right? So I would typically break this into these many different layers. Yeah. Basically, collection correctly, then what was the data Uh, business logic acceptance test. 
that's a behavior that's some kind of a logic the data has some meaning right the unit tests are you know i give you a list you filter back and give it to me or not right what you're filtering are you applying the right criteria or not but the filters might have been passed from outside based on some other conditions right whether you are passing the right conditions are you getting the final list back after everything is done that's something that i would do in my business logic acceptance test uh and then when we go further layers up we will see that there's a whole flow around that and we can validate that we'll come to you one second I don't think I mean that's a very hypothetical thing but mistake I'm calling add and subtract is getting called it cannot be caused in the unit test it will get caught in the workflow test for me if we were to extrapolate this example then it would get caught in the integration test for me but uh, a workflow test sorry integration test just make sure that my connectivity to the server is correct right whether i pass two numbers and i get back a number back i will just in my test i will assert that it is a valid number right i don't care if it's 2 or 5 or 8 because then see the the point i'm trying to make here is that every test should have a single responsibility if every test has a single responsibility then you have very pin pointed feedback that you will get when that test fails you know there is one reason for the test to fail you don't have to sit and debug again so that's the underlying thought process right uh, is that each test should have a single reason to fail which means it has a single responsibility going on right so if i see my unit test fail then i know a bunch of other things will also fail but if the unit test fails i can go there and i can get pin pointed feedback if my integration if my unit test didn't fail but my integration test fail then i know that some of my configuration is wrong or the server is not up i am not able to reach the server like this is this is the reasons that things can go wrong if my workflow test fails but none of the other test fails that means that there is some kind of a issue with different parts talking to each other as they go through a workflow right and then i can dive deeper into it maybe write a unit test more focused unit test over there to see why why i'm getting certain different results uh so as we move up we can get a specific reason for the test to fail so integration 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 that's what i would put it under business logic acceptance test a module is doing something another module is doing something now these two modules are going to work together to achieve some kind of a business logic for me right so that's what i would verify over here in my business logic acceptance test integration means across boundaries of your system to subsystems to external systems things like that that's what integration means otherwise everything is inside the same memory inside the same vm or inside whatever you're using So it depends how you slice your modules, right? Uh, if you slice it architecturally, that's one way to do it. If you slice it based on functionality, that's another way to do it, right? This handles this piece of functionality. It has UI, backend, whatever else required for it to do its job. <laughs> integration test would verify that from the UI, I'm able to actually call a service. it's not throwing a 404 when i call a service that's all i need to verify right
all of these are regression tests. Regression test means tests that are used to avoid, you know, unexpected failures at a later point of time. Any test is run after the fact as a regression test. All of these are regression tests. But even if I have heavy UI, I can unit test my UI, right? So it, it would not increase. So here we, we try and verify things like, for example, I'm producing a report. I want to make sure the report is actually visible, right? What data is showing up on the report is already verified, right? How the data is actually getting rendered is where the UI plays a part. Everything else is tested. Let's say I have JavaScript that takes a JSON, does a bunch of manipulation, shows it up, right? I can take the JavaScript and unit test it. So each of those components can be unit tested and in my opinion should be unit tested. I don't want to sit in a car that someone's not test the engine, right? I want to make sure those things are tested out. And then when we go at the UI level, things that could go wrong are very little, and those are the kind of things, the cosmetic things across browser, across operating system, stuff like that. And that needs to be verified. Who's causing the pop-up to come up? JavaScript is going to cause those pop-ups to come up. So I test my JavaScript if it's going to pop up correctly or not. What's being shown is what you give to the pop-up, right? So I need to verify if my JavaScript is giving the right message on a pop-up. So I can just block the alert and verify whether it's working or not. It would be much easier to test it over there in my opinion. Because a lot of our UI tools, testing tools, will fail as soon as pop-ups start showing up, right? They don't know how to deal with it. So forget what it is. What is the objective of the test? What do you want to achieve? Which data is right? What the... Can you do that at the business logic level? Forget why do you want to simulate? Why do you want to make life hard for yourself, right? There's a lot of other things to do in life. So you write an integration test because it's not in your control. You want to make sure you can call to it and it gives you some data. Once I know you, it gives me some data, then that's it. If I'm not writing the web service, why do I write tests for it? I don't want to take someone else's kid and start <laughs> keeping in my house, right? That's not my problem. If someone else is building something, that's not your responsibility to test. We need to test what we are building. to test your interface is working correctly. Given this input to your interface, does your interface show it correctly or not? And then there will be certainly other kinds of tests, maybe workflow tests or other kinds of tests that will make sure that what this guy is actually giving is what you're showing on your UI, right? In a business scenario, if things are working correctly, that's what you would verify at that level. That's a problem right there. Stop that, right? Life is too short. Don't go there where someone's building in isolation, another guy's building. We said that was Stone Age. We've come a long way from there. Those days are gone, 10 years ago. These days you would sit and you would take a thin slice and build it out so that you know you both are not going in different direction. One guy's not going to London, another guy's not going to Japan. You don't want things like that happening. You take a thin slice, cuts across the whole thing, and go end to end. Right? Then the chances of all of these concerns will go away. Right? 
so that's basically the different layers. Uh, I'm happy to take any more questions at this point. Yep. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you need 0% manual test. We will come to that. Uh, but we need manual testing, not manual checking. There's a difference between testing and checking. Uh, Michael Bolton, a uh, bunch of other guys have made that very clear that there is a difference between checking and testing. Checking is I know this is what I expect and I'm verifying if this came. All checking by nature can be automated 100%. Right? Testing is probing a system to see what will happen. You don't know what the outcome is. You are trying to explore, you're trying to figure out, you're trying to see what will happen. That cannot be automated. It can be automated to some extent, but you don't know what to expect, so what do you assert? Exploratory testing would fit into that. Some forms of usability test would fit into that, right? Where you're exploring, where you're trying to figure out, and that is by nature manual. Now, it doesn't have to be at the end. There are techniques we will talk about where you can do those things before you write a single line of code, right? But you still need some kind of exploration, right? which is important. And that then gets converted into checks, which can be automated. So I'm not saying you don't need manual testing. You certainly, I mean, manual testing is oxymoron, in my opinion. Testing by nature means manual, right? Checking by nature can be automated. But a lot of times what ends up happening is we spend all our time doing checking. You should get two, is two coming over here. That can be automated. Machines are good at that. We are not good at that, right? So we'll come to exploratory testing in some time. Uh, but these are different layers of tests. And uh, again, you don't have to follow all the layers, right? See what fits your need. But ask yourself the question, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Is this thing that I'm writing has a single responsibility or not? When this fails, will I know what went wrong? That's the important thing. No, uh, that's a bad example. At workflow test, what we will be checking, for example, the calculator has a history uh, feature, right? I went through a bunch of operations, and can I step back through each of the operations now? That's the kind of things I would do in a workflow test. And again, the calculator example does not expand itself to the real world examples that we deal with. Wrong API is getting called, integration. You can do, you can do, I mean, obviously you can do at the unit level from the UI side, you can make sure that you call the right method, right? Uh, but, you know, in case there is some magic stuff happening, then your integration test could catch that if you're calling something completely random. But unit test should be able to capture that I wanted to send this ex I wanted to call, let's say, this REST URL. But instead of calling this REST URL, I ended up calling some other REST URL. I don't need the server sitting around. I could simply test that in my unit test whether I'm making the right REST call or not. Again, a lot depends, right? You, you generally using frameworks. You're using proven protocols. You're using a whole bunch of things. So, you know, you don't have to go to that level of nitty-gritty testing. If you're building your own protocols, if you're doing things like that, then yes, you want to make sure whether when I actually call this, is it sending the right HTML, HTTP request across the wire or not? Because you have now built that. But if you're using some library which does that, then all you need to make sure is whether you call the right thing at whatever abstraction you're working. Okay. So that's the different levels. So I didn't want to go into these details, which we've kind of discussed. There are tools that can be used at each of the layers. Who does them? When they do it? What is the level at which they operate? What is the objective? These slides are up, so you can go look at that in leisure, right? Uh, this also talks about different touch, touch points as we go through the product lifecycle of where, what would be written, and how we mistake-proof things instead of it being, you know, inspection-heavy. 
So let's quickly take an example and walk through this, right? So, yes. So we talk about like before we start a product, we go through a product discovery process. We try and understand what is that we are trying to build, what is the vision of that we are trying to build, and typically that gets captured as acceptance test at you know your story map level, the criteria at the different story map levels. From there, you get into your plan level where you define what is the goal of each of your release, and you set some you know define some goals around this. These are again things that can be automated. Then you do your first release theme. Uh, the theme itself talks about a bunch of scenarios that you're going to try and achieve in that. And those scenarios again can be uh, tested from an end-to-end -end flow kind of things. Then you talk about work stream. This is where you're starting to split work across different kind of themes or things like that. So this is where you can start looking at what kind of integration test you might need, what kind of workflow test you might need. Uh, then when you get into your iteration planning, this is where you can break down at the story level and start writing acceptance tests at the story level. Uh, when your iteration starts, you know, typically developers and business people would collaborate, write out of acceptance tests, do exploratory testing, do buddy testing, do a bunch of other things along the way. Uh, which means that when they are done at this point, right, they already have all of these set of tests working. The, the higher level tests will still be failing because the whole thing is not completed. But whatever you set up at the iteration level is working and everything that was completed before that is working. Uh, at the demo part, you basically get the acceptance. Uh, when you hit a release milestone, then you again do a bunch of other kinds of tests to ensure that whatever was built previously is still working. Uh, at the release level, you do sanity testing across different live environments and things like that, and you push it. Right? This can be done in one check-in. All of these steps could go in one check-in, or they could be broken down into, depending on what your nature of organization is. So it tends to kind of accommodate for that nature as well. I need to quickly jump into one other section here. Have you guys uh, heard about uh, Brian Marek's uh, testing quadrant? I think it might be relevant in this context. Let me quickly bring that up. So this is something that uh, we talk a lot when we talk about understanding what is the purpose behind each of the tests and where it comes from. Uh, which can be done before. So when building products, there are two key questions we ask ourselves. Are we building the right product? Are we building the product right? The top one is a business facing question. Are we building the right product? I mean, does this help us achieve what we want to achieve, right? And are we building the product right is more of technology slash implementation facing question, right? Uh, Brian Marek, who is one of the leading testing gurus and also the Agile signatory, uh, manifesto signatory, he talks about, you know, I can take any test and break them into these four quadrants. On the top, you have the business facing. On the bottom, you have technology slash implementation facing. Then I have a set of tests which help me drive development. These are things that I do before or while I'm, you know, building software. And these are things, the, the test of, set of tests called critiquing tests. These are done when I am done with a line of code, when I'm done with a class, when I'm done with a feature, when I'm done with a release. Uh, so these are done after the fact. So these set of tests are done while and before. These tests are done just after. Right? So now if you think of this quadrant, uh, it will help you understand a little bit of where the pyramid comes from. Right? Uh, so what do you think would go into this quadrant over here? What a set of tests that are technology slash implementation facing questions? Yeah, no doubt about that, right? So everyone will say unit test would fit into that quadrant. What set of tests would fit? Where where is integration test fit? Is integration test going to help you answer are we building the right product? Or will it help you answer are you building the product right? And do you want to keep it till the end or do you want to flush it out before you start, you know? building stuff. You want to write your integration test before you start flushing things out. This is what I expect when I call this, right? Or this is how I will call you. This is what I will pass. This is what I expect back. Do whatever you need to do. This is what I expect. I would set that contract before we start, right? So integration test would also fit into this, clear? 
what would fit into this quadrant over here? Acceptance test, right? Acceptance test help you answer, are you building the right product? It helps you from the business perspective, from the user's perspective. What else will fit into this quadrant? Something that was not there on the testing pyramid so far. System test, does it help you answer, are we building the right product? Beta testing. Beta testing can only be done after you have something. I mean, that's the definition of beta testing is like before you push something out to people. Analytical tests. Tell me more about it. Just hang on one second, let him finish and then we'll come to you. Go ahead. There's some kind of an acceptance for whether, you know, given this, if I provide you this algorithm, will it be actually helpful for you or not, right? You want to validate. Whether your ability to crunch the number and be able to come up with something is slightly different from whether if I came up with that number or I came up with that data, will it still be useful for you? I would divide it into two parts. The, the first part that I talked about, whether given something, can I even come up with the number? Right? To me, would go in the technology slash implementation. The first one is more of whether even this is useful. Can something like this be used, can be consumed or things like that. Right? So that would go under there. And I would kind of put it in the acceptance test. Uh, but you could, you could call it something else. Doesn't matter. That's the idea. Right? Correct. Obviously, right? Because you don't want to spend all the time and say, yes, I came up with this number. Now what do I do with this? Requirement testing. So how do you do requirement testing before you actually start? This is, that's a very good point, And that's, that's the other thing that is there on that. So how do you do requirement testing? Someone saying that we need this kind of stuff, or we as a product company believe that if we did this, this would be awesome. So you could build a prototype that's one way to where you want to invest as little as possible, and you want to get some validation. You want to test whether this idea will work or not, whether it's useful or not, whether it's usable or not. OK? What else could fit into that? So we call something as, so accepted test we talked about, then we talk about low fidelity prototypes. Low fidelity prototypes are things that you can do where you can basically validate whether this idea will work or not, whether something like this is useful or not. It, in a lot of cases, I gave a talk recently, a keynote at uh, the Agile Russia conference where my talk was hacking your MVPs. MVP stands for minimum viable product. So can you even hack a minimum viable product without even having to build that, right? So I gave a series of examples where people have done interesting things even without actually having built anything to validate whether the idea is useful or not, whether the feature they are thinking about is useful or not. So one example was when we were at the at Industrial Logic when we were building the e-learning, uh, we felt, we, so at, uh, in e-learning one of the things you could do is you could ask a question. When, you, when you're going through some e-learning, you don't understand something, you could ask a question, right? And that would basically be sent as an email to us and then one of us would go and respond to that, right? We felt it would be awesome instead of them sending an email and this thing if they could chat with someone live, right? So we thought that would be an awesome feature. Uh, so while we were all like ready to start building the chat feature, build that whole chat infrastructure and all, we said, well, let's quickly validate if this idea is useful or not, right? So what we did was we basically put, you know, seven experts available chat now. And we wanted to see how many people would click on it. And guess what? Everyone clicked on it. Because everyone was curious what it is. 
and then when it, they clicked, we said, you know, this is what we are planning to build. Would you be interested? And pretty much everyone clicked no. Right? So done deal. <laughs> Feature done. <laughs> right? It was just uh, like less than 10 minutes worth of work to put something out there, validate the idea. The data speaks for itself. Right? Uh, obviously, we, we can't stop there because you need to understand why people don't want to do because it makes total sense to you. Right? Why people don't want. So then we reach out to people, we send them emails, or we call them up, or we did all kinds of things to understand why people didn't want to. You know? And we understood the reasons, and we, you know, fair enough. That was something we completely missed out. Uh, so that's one example. The other thing that when I was in Russia, one of the things we did is I met this guy who wanted to build an app, uh, which is basically your stylist on your phone. It will know uh, whether what you're wearing actually suits you or not, whether you're riding, wearing the right colors, whether you know, if stripe suits you or not, brilliant idea. I think it'll be a you know total hit, right? So while this guy is like fully ready, I'm going to pump in a million dollars, build this thing, and it's going to be the next biggest startup. He said, let's quickly go validate this, right? So we took this phone, this very phone. We walked around you know the mall, and we basically took the photo app on this. There's nothing inside it. It's just a photo app, and we said, here we have a product. This product uh, will Uh, or not. Uh, so we validated 